Hey everybody, this is Johnny, and this is a video on the CalTBA, why it is a problem and why it needs to go away. This is a critique of the CalTBA. In this video, I'm going to go over what the problems are with the CalTBA, what a teaching assessment should look like, and some advice for those who are taking this test or those who are administering it. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. I've been doing TPAs with student teachers for a number of years, from PACT to EdTPA to CalTPA, and all are problematic. I'm a lecturer and a teacher educator at a Tier 1 research university. I did my master's work at Stanford University, and it still troubles me how invested Stanford is in TPAs and performance assessments for teachers. I've worked with student teachers, beginning teachers through PACT, EdTPA, and CalTPA, and found troubles with all of them. And I'm not the only one. States have decided TPAs, teacher performance assessments, aren't appropriate or worthwhile for beginning teachers and have put them aside. In this video, I'm going to give good reasons to put CalTPA aside. So there are problems with the CalTPA. It's quite a list. Here's some things that I'll set out in this video. First off, it does not represent good teaching. There's just too much of everything in it. It pushes a kind of canned robotic teaching. It's counter to diversity, no matter what it claims to be. And it's just badly made, poorly written, and Byzantine. I've been to Istanbul and didn't see anything like this there. Thin slice of something that develops over time. It is of questionable reliability. It's in constant development. It's a sledgehammer to change teaching and education. It's a gatekeeper, not a tool to promote good teaching. And it bullies novices to be experts way too early in their careers. And too often has become the curriculum in teacher education programs. And their opportunity costs. It steals time and attention away from what should matter in a preparation program. And it promotes teaching as a form of compliance. The CalTPA claims to represent good teaching. It doesn't. It's atomized. It attempts to represent the California teaching performance expectations. There are 44 of them. You can imagine what a test looks like when it's trying to ask to do too many things and ask too much of the people participating in the assessment. So here are the California teacher performance expectations and one test to rule them all. That's questionable. The CalTBA claims to represent good teaching, but what it really tries to do is represent everything that's been out there under the sun over the last generation. It's a stone soup assessment. Here's part of the pile of topics that have been put into the CalTBA. UDL, assessment for learning, evidence-based practice, funds of knowledge, deficit thinking, educational technology, graphic organizers, higher order thinking, developmental appropriateness, self-assessment, rubrics, cultural linguistic assets, feedback, differentiation, academic language, there are other things as well. In the foreword of the assessment guide, they proudly announced that there are 22 experts that contributed to the making of CalTBA. I don't know about you, but that sounds like too many cooks in the kitchen. And what we end up with is a stone soup assessment. The CalTPA sees teaching as a series of things to be done, a menu, a script. It's an accountant's view of teaching. In my conversations with my students who have completed the CalTPA, they say they don't ev want to ever teach that way again. They felt it was a bit robotic. They felt it was stultifying. And then to follow this up, their mentor teachers, their cooperating teachers, ask that we don't ask them to do that again because it was just awkward for the students, awkward for the program, just not good teaching. It met the requirements of CalTPA, it was intended to, but then the student teachers and the cooperating teachers want to move on to good teaching, not robotic teaching. This robotic view of teaching, this accountant's view of teaching moves that have to be met, gets away from the fundamental things about teaching that we really care about, which is the art and science of teaching, the responsive kind of teaching that we know is fundamental to doing right by our kids. We don't teach by scripts, we teach kids. The CalTPA puts as fundamental that teachers need to be considering the needs of all students, and so diversity is very important to the CalTPA. The problem with this is that it doesn't allow for the diversity of context or experiences that beginning teachers might have across California. Schools are not the same. Classrooms are not the same from school to school. Where is the room for the diversity of contexts and experiences 
student teachers might have in the very different schools that exist in California. So the Cal TPA sets out a standard set of teacher expectations across grade levels and teaching contexts. So some questions. Where, do, where does play for learning sit? Where does student-initiated and determined programs sit? Because the Cal TPA is all about the teacher managing and directing everything. What about integrated cross-disciplinary programs? Cal TPA holds single-subject focused disciplinary teaching at its heart. There's no clear attention to or allowance for the diverse forms of teaching. What about schools where project-based learning is at the heart of what happens? And there's many problems with dual immersion programs. My students who are bilingual candidates struggle with the Cal TPA because it doesn't make room for the kinds of teaching that they're doing, good teaching, important teaching, in the context in which they're working. And of course, alternative programs, which have grown tremendously over the last few years. Where does Cal TPA sit in regards to that kind of diversity? Another consideration about diversity is just the different grade levels or developmental levels as well. My work with multiple subjects candidates is all about K through 5 or TK through 5. And what counts for teaching, what matters to teaching, looks different in TK than in fifth grade. Not wholly, but there are fundamental differences. And the, the assessment, the Cal TBA, doesn't make room for those. There's another quality of diversity that the Cal TPA ignores. Our students are not the same. Beginning teachers come from lots of different places, lots of different kinds of experiences, and they have their own diverse interests, needs, and assets. It's just ironic that the Cal TPA sets that out as fundamental to the first cycle, but doesn't make room for that for the pre-service teachers who are engaged in the assessment. We have to recognize that pre-service teachers are students as well, and they come with their own wealth of diverse strengths and interests. And another fundamental thing is that they're going to be on their own learning trajectory. They might be going through similar things across their experience as beginning teachers, but they are following their own path with good direction from mentors and such. But it's not the same, and the Cal TPA treats the experience or the expected necessary experience of beginning teachers as necessarily the same. How does the Cal TPA make it possible for each of our teacher candidates to shine with their best teaching? to bring forth what matters to them from the experiences they bring to their teaching. Now I'm going to talk about the fundamental brokenness of the Cal TPA. How as an instrument it's got many, many problems. Let's talk about what it measures. It measures managing materials. It measures the ability to make video. It measures the ability to respond to arcane and overburdened prompts. And it measures the ability to work towards numerous overburdened criteria set out in too many rubrics. Let's take a look. This is from cycle one. You can see it's a long list of materials, each with particular formats and qualifications that need to be submitted. This is a mess for student teachers. How much time and attention do they give to, did I put the right format? Did I submit the right form? Is this going to be too long or acceptable? And then there are the prompts on the forms. These are just terrible. They're just word salad. Let's read the first one. Engaging students in content-specific higher order thinking. Explain how you implemented learning activities and or informal assessment and why you use the specific instructional strategies, e.g. modeling thinking, questioning students, using resources and or materials, accessing educational technology to provide access and engage students in challenging content-specific learning using higher order thinking, i.e. analysis, synthesis, evaluation, interpretation, transfer. Do you think there's enough there? Let's read the second one. Focus students. Explain how the lesson plan addresses individual assets and learning needs of the three focus students, including, as appropriate, assistive technology and provides inclusive learning opportunities, if relevant, may include an explanation of additional support that occurs outside the classroom to engage fully with the content of the lesson, including English language development. For focus student one, explain how the lesson plan supports process, progress toward their ELD goals. That's just one prompt. Sounds like five. And the next, student assets and learning needs. Explain how the learning plan incorporates, affirms, and validates students' cultural and linguistic resources, socioeconomic backgrounds as well, 
funds of knowledge, prior experiences, and interests related to the content of the lesson. There's a lot, to, lot being asked in that one. The next one. Student learning activities. Explain why you selected the learning activities and how you will engage all students in higher order thinking, analysis, synthesis, evaluation, interpretation, transfer, and applications of concepts or skills to purposefully advance their understanding of the specific content, e.g. use of manipulatives, think-pair-share, model, models, drawing, or maps, graphic organizers, performances, demonstrations, labs. And to follow, Social identity, students expressed self-concept derived from a social group that is evident through peer and or adult interactions inside or outside of school. I get lots of questions about this one. And last, what adaptations, accommodations, and or modifications, including, as appropriate, assistive technologies will support individual student learning needs beyond the UDL supports built into the lesson? Lots of word salad, lots of, lots of Three things being asked in one prompt does not help student teachers. And of course, there are the rubrics. Pre-service teachers need to understand that only level three really matters and that each of the criteria set in level three must be met for that score to be attained. Let's read this one from a level three criterion. Candidates planned activities, strategies, and or assessment checking for understanding, during or outside of the lesson are designed to provide a safe and positive learning environment, promote Focus Student 3's well-being, and support Focus Student 3's progress toward meeting the content-specific learning goals and, if appropriate, ELD goals. Okay, what does that mean? How many things are being required to meet this particular Level 3 criterion? It turns out the CalTBA does not follow its own script. It sets out lots of things that are worthwhile to teaching, and it concerns itself with assessment and right forms of assessment, but then it doesn't follow them itself. It's built counter to the things it's expecting of pre-service teachers in the assessment. So let's start with UDL, Universal Design for Learning. It puts Universal Design for Learning at the heart of expectations for teaching, and it does not integrate any of the core principles of UDL in its own design. UDL suggests multiple means of representation, where a teacher sets out materials in varied, accessible ways for students to engage. CalTBA doesn't do that. There's the assessment guide. Where is the website? Where are the videos? Where is the other ways in which student teachers might access what matters to CalTBA? Then there is CalTBA's one fundamental problem with UDL. It doesn't allow for varied expression. There's only one valid way to show teaching competence for beginning teachers, and that's through the CalTBA and the way it sets it out. This is from UDL. Action and expression. Learners differ in the ways that they can navigate a learning environment and express what they know. It should also be recognized that action and expression require a great deal of strategy, practice, and organization. And this is another area in which learners can differ. In reality, there is not one means of action and expression that will be optimal for all learners. Providing options for action and expression is essential. CalTBA doesn't do this. CalTBA sets itself out to be a reliable measure of teacher performance. It is not. It's a high stakes test. One lesson or one set of lessons is required to represent one's teaching. We know that teaching matters over time, it changes over time, we get better and we improve, but just one instance or one set of lessons to represent one's teaching is not sufficient. Fundamentally, it does not reflect growth or change over time, only instances. Any learning, especially professional learning, should be measured over time with opportunities for learning from mistakes and ongoing reflection. Teacher performance assessment must be focused on development, not high-stakes singular measures. When we began our work with CalTBA in my program, it was promised that CalTBA was going to be formative in the way that EdTBA hasn't been, and we haven't found that at all. It's a high-stakes test. CalTBA frames assessment essential to a continuous improvement cycle. That's at the very front of the assessment guide, this continuous improvement cycle 
then it doesn't do that or doesn't participate in that activity for beginning teachers. Essentially, it takes just a narrow slice of a beginning novice teacher's teaching experience to make judgments about the whole of their teaching or their potential. That's not all right. Then there's a question of reliability. cal continues to make changes year after year. I had the unfortunate situation of having all my materials for cal ready to work with my student teachers in August. At the end of the month, beginning of September, cal changed things. Not fair to instructors and not fair to beginning teachers. If cal claims that it's going to be a reliable measure of teacher performance, then it needs to be reliable. It needs to be constant. And we need to be assured year after year of what to expect. I'm going to set out some of the most fundamental flaws in Cal TBA. It doesn't practice what it preaches. It sets out pedagogical activities and practices that are worthwhile, but then it doesn't incorporate them or follow them itself. The Cal TBA requires beginning teachers to use feedback in their teaching to improve student performance. Feedback should be specific and doable. It should offer clear direction for improvement. Candidates who fail the Cal TPA receive abominable, terrible feedback, just completely worthless. It doesn't do any of the things required of good feedback. Let me share this story with you. Any of you who work in a program will know this story because you've heard it from your own candidates. Failed my first Cal TPA. My university makes us take an online seminar class to solely focus on completing the TPAs for California. I have two professors that gave us feedback and let us know when we are ready to submit because they compare our work to the rubric. They gave me passing scores and I've been getting glowing reviews from my master teacher and my university supervisor. I thought I had it in the bag. I received my results from the first cycle last night and was surprised to see I got the lowest score on the video portions. I'm still in denial. I'm angry at my professors for making me believe that I was ready, and I'm depressed, depressed because I've been on this journey for years, and it seems that it will never end. I've worked with children for 15 years in other areas and found my life's calling as a teacher. I'm supposed to finally graduate this February at 34 years old, and now I don't know what the hell is going to happen. I was extremely proud of my video clips. My teens were on point and fully engaged and responsive. To top it off, the report I received didn't have meaningful feedback, nothing specific referencing my actual work, just some copy-paste crap. I paid $1,000 for that required class and $150 for the cycle. I feel like the school needs to take responsibility for this, but I doubt they will. I'm just so heartbroken because I'm dying to be a teacher despite all the negative aspects that are attached to it. I still have to work on my second cycle and somehow fix the other one and pay for it again. Rant over, I'm just looking for someone that understands how I'm feeling right now. Lots here, and some of it I'm going to go over it in detail in a moment. But do hold on to this part. To top it off, the report I received didn't have meaningful feedback. Nothing specific referencing my actual work. Just some copy-paste crap. I had a student teacher last year who didn't pass the Cal TBA Cycle 1. And as required, I sat with her for an hour or two going through her materials to say what was going on with it and where she might have missed something. And I'm usually good at that. I know a lot about the Cal TBA. Lots of good work I've done in Cal TBA with my students. But I could not find anything. And it was struggle for me because I'm sitting there after two hours and I essentially tell her, you did everything right. You should have passed. And she's so frustrated, like, well, I, you know, I didn't get a passing score. What do I have to do now? And then we decided, she decided, to send it in again and get it rescored. Most folks won't do this. Most folks will go back and redo and spend too much time trying to make it right again. She did, and she got it back, and she got a passing score. She had to suffer through having got the wrong score, gotten the wrong score to start with, and then spend hours with me trying to find out what she did wrong when in fact she hadn't. And of course, the fundamental thing is, with her first score, the failing score, the rubric and the response, the feedback, had no information in it. It was all about a cut-and-paste job 
straight up from the rubrics themselves. No specific feedback that helped her to improve or to give her direction about what was wrong. A complete failure in feedback by the Cal TPA. Now I'm going to share with you why the Cal TPA is so fundamentally flawed. It starts with its history. Its roots are in No Child Left Behind. Back in the day, No Child Left Behind was built to make schools better, beat them into shape through assessment. Schools were going to be punished if they didn't have the right kinds of scores. Schools would be reconstituted. It was all about assessment to beat education into shape. Out of that became, came teacher performance assessment as well. We weren't getting good enough teachers. So what do we need? We need some kind of teacher performance assessment that will limit who gets into the profession and make possible better teachers. So it's really fundamentally rooted in, CalTP is really fundamentally rooted into, in this bad thing. Out of No Child Left Behind, the teacher performance assessment that first started it was packed. Then EdTPA came along through the Stanford folks and California decided to make its own, supposedly better, CalTPA. But it's still rooted in that one bad thing. It's an assessment as a hammer to make change in education. The problem with this notion is that we've come to understand assessment much, much better since No Child Left Behind. Assessment should sit alongside our teaching as a means and a tool to understand it better, to, to better by our students. But it only works that way through reflection and ongoing assessment, not the singular punitive kinds of yes, no, you're good enough to teach or not teach measure that TPA sets out. CalTPA is about making or breaking beginning teachers. It doesn't offer itself as an assessment to learn from, to make teaching better. It's one-off. It's high stakes. Because it's so firmly rooted in no child left behind notions of assessment, it's got a deficit stance. It ironically penalizes candidates for any suggestion of deficit thinking that was built in response to notion that there are just too many bad teachers and this needs to be fixed. It's a gatekeeper. CalTBA does not set itself out as a formative tool, a guide or a tool to find one's way to better teaching. It's simply a gatekeeper. And it was built around not letting bad teachers into the profession. And everybody has to suffer through that deficit notion of teaching as they move their way through CalTBA. CalTBA requires novices to be experts. This has been one that's been most difficult for me over the years. At the very onset of the profession, in the very opening months of preparation, student teachers have to take a high stakes test to see whether they're worthy. And they have to show some measure of expertise from the start. Other professions, if you think about medicine or law, give time to preparation and then have the appropriate assessment for entry into the profession at the right time when some expertise should be expected from the prepara preparation that was engaged. CalTPA does not allow beginning teachers to be beginners. This is ironic because one of the requirements in the assessment is that the lessons set out by the beginning teachers are developmentally appropriate for their students, whereas CalTPA is not that for beginning teachers at all. A teacher performance assessment would be more appropriate after two or three years of teaching, just before tenure. A teacher performance assessment might be a good requirement for a tenured position in teaching, not at the very onset of teacher preparation. No other profession does that. It must be understood that TPAs were built to do other kinds of work rather than just be gatekeepers for the teaching profession. The Cal TPA was built as a bully it was built to change shoddy teacher education programs. There are many of them. There are way too many teacher education programs in the state that are out to make money, that are not really invested in worthwhile teacher preparation. I was working with a beginning teacher at a school once, and I visited regularly, did my mentorship work, and was visiting one time, and a young person came along and asked me a few questions. The young person was in a different teacher preparation program, and was wondering about all my visits and all the work that I was doing with my student teacher. Turns out this young person was in a teacher preparation program that wasn't doing very well by him. In fact, the only interaction 
that they had with anybody in the program was the two or three times when their supervisor came to evaluate them. Everything else was online and remote and just distant. That's not my program. My program is about intense mentoring over time to build really great teachers. There are too many programs that aren't invested in that, and I get that. But using the CalTBA as a way to bully programs into changing means that we all get bullied. Of course, what has followed with CalTBA as being a bully is that CalTBA has become the curriculum in teacher preparation programs. In seminars and in field work, the conversations become about CalTBA rather than teaching and kids. Of course, what has followed is courses designed specifically to pass the CalTBA, test prep courses. And these, of course, push into other courses that should be about teaching and learning. Do look at the costs. $500, $500, $250. Our student teachers don't have much money, and we're asking them to do this, to pass this test? That's not all right. And this, of course, is all about opportunity costs. Too often, I'm out in the field doing an observation, and my student teacher needs to talk to me about what's working and not working for Cal2BA, taking us away from the very real teaching they're doing with kids in the classroom. For teacher preparation programs, time, attention, and stress of ensuring novice teachers pass the high-stakes test steals focus and attention from purposeful, formative teacher preparation. So how many teacher educators across programs are pressed by the submission dates to change their programs, change the focus, change the content of their teachings and seminars. Not okay. What comes to matter in the student teacher's preparation and in our preparation programs is an external measure of our validity. And that steals so much from what we should be doing. So what should a teacher assessment do? It should start by informing novice teachers about their strengths and areas to grow, and it should offer direction and true feedback. It should be an assessment for learning, not just a measure of whether you are suited for the profession or not at the very beginning of your career. It should be framed in actual, genuine expert practice, defined by experts in the profession. It should be defined by professionals not by a committee of 22 trying to hit every political mark and trying to incorporate every salient or interesting educational topic of the last 20 years. It should be about teacher expertise defined by teacher experts in the profession. It should recognize that teachers do not come in one mold. There's lots of ways to be a great teacher. Great teaching comes from the experiences, gifts, passion, and preparation each teacher brings to their work. Hold true to the UDL considerations. Broaden what counts as representation of good teaching. It should understand that expertise comes through time and experience, not through a cram course you pay money for. It should be continuous, defined by developmentally appropriate milestones from novice practice to expert practice, not a single measure at the very beginning of your professional work. It should be consequential at the right time, Understanding that moving from novice to professional takes time and should not be a gatekeeper set before beginners in their larval stage, just as they're starting out. It should be a resource to teacher preparation programs, should give shape to the ongoing preparatory formative assessment that should be a part of any program. It should inform the curriculum, not own it. CalTBA seeks to colonize teacher education programs not all right. It should hold central the art and science of teaching, not try to be all things to all people with notions of what matters. And lastly, teacher assessment should be integral to teacher preparation, not external or extraordinary, not require more money, not require additional courses. Teacher assessment should not be the CalTVA.